Pushkin. Corvair is a fun car for fun lovers. For car lovers. Corvair, a most unusual car for people who enjoy the unusual. A most unusual car indeed. The 1960 Chevrolet Corvair didn't look like your typical General Motors car of the era. Its bodywork was naked of tail fins and excess chrome. Its styling was restrained. It had a slim wraparound belt line and subtle body surfacing. And that's just the outside. The Corvair was unusual from top to bottom, from stem to stern, and it was poised to put General Motors and maybe the whole American car business on a more sophisticated, driver-oriented path. It was the vehicle GM would send into battle with the European cars just starting to hit our shores in the late 1950s and early 60s. You know, what's funny is this doesn't look like your typical American 60s car, does it? There's no oh, chrome no. everywhere. It's got this beautiful like ridge to the side. It's almost like a modern car, the way you've got this little bone line and the bodywork tucks under, super sophisticated for, for the era, real restraint. It's a cool face. It looks very European, you know? It does not look American at all. Pretty nice size interior. Yeah, you can make out easier in, in the car. <laughs> Chevrolet Corvair was one of the most consequential cars of all time, but maybe not for the reason you think. It wasn't because the car was America's first real attempt to beat back the imports. It wasn't even because it became the target of a huge safety crusade, one we'll talk about later in the episode. The Corvair was important because it represents a fork in the road of human accountability. My name is Eddie Alterman, and I've been editing car magazines since I was in short pants. This is Car Show, my podcast about why we drive, what we drive. The Corvair takes us to an important moment. The question it posed was, can a car maker trust its customers to learn how to handle and maintain an unconventional automobile? Or must it design for the lowest level of skill and involvement? And what does that mean for those of us who love to drive. Yeah, right. Yeah. So. Well, this thing is great. I love I love enamel paint. I don't know how old the paint actually is. When I got it, it was I, I guess just been painted or something. Wasn't I'm in a parking lot in Encino, California with Brian Morris and his light yellow 1963 Corvair convertible. Where is the... Now what do you want to do? Start the car? That's yes. probably what you'd like to do. Okay. Uh, just turn that to the right. Okay. A vuncular, self-deprecating, and clad in a light yellow shirt and pants to match the car. Brian drove the couple hours to LA from Camarillo to let us drive his Corvair. Brian bought this car from a family friend. He'd always wanted a Corvair convertible because his fraternity brother had a yellow one in 1966. Brian is convinced the car helped his friend woo his future wife. And just looking at it, you can see why. This was the kind of car a dashing Ivy Leaguer would use to cruise Princeton at night. This has lovely light steering, rides great. It's really kind of relaxing to drive, I would say, if I had to put a word to it. I think it's got enough power. I'd say the faster you go, the easier it is to drive. Interesting. I mean, we're going 55 miles an hour. Feels really straight, stable, easy. We're not doing any extreme maneuvers, but... It's so mild-mannered. That was lovely. This is a great old... You know what this is? This is a 
go get ice cream car. <laughs> Sleek, trim, not like those other hulking jock cars the jock kids drove. This was the American car for the American sophisticate, the person who smoked Nat Sherman cigarettes, who read The New Yorker, who wore white bucks. It was General Motors' answer to the VWs, Renaults, and Alfa Romeos rapidly infiltrating America. A little context is important here. Up until this point, General Motors, the parent corporation of Chevrolet, was the apple of mid-century America. Utterly dominant. Essential to our way of life. It had an apparent monopoly on good ideas and seemed capable of achieving the impossible. Post-World War II, GM led the industry with an astonishing 50% share of the car market. Its mid-century run was the stuff of epics. GM invented the automotive design department. It thought harder and better about self-driving cars back in 1958 than most autonomous car hucksters do today. It sent cars to the moon on Apollo rockets. It built a temple to itself in Warren, Michigan, designed by Aero Saarinen, the same guy who built the TWA terminal at JFK and the Gateway Arch in St. Louis. GM made trucks, Buses, locomotives, home appliances, you name it. And of course, cars. Sleek Corvettes, extravagant Cadillac Eldorados, chrome-toothed Buick Roadmasters. It was Oz. But substantial headwinds buffeted its mid-century progress. This administration will continue to undertake any measure that will assist healthy economic recovery. At the start of Eisenhower's second presidential term, a recession had many car buyers reconsidering their lane-filling, tail-fin barges with their acres of chrome. European cars like VWs and MGs presented new options for the sporty set or the frugally-minded Jeffersonian. In 1954, only about 20,000 Americans bought small European cars. Four years later, that number was 20 times higher, almost 10% of the car market. Critically, the big three had no small sedan offerings at that time. They only made them in two sizes back then, large and extra large. Enter the Corvair. It was what happened when the mightiest car company on earth set its mind to downsizing the Corvair would fuse the engineering ingenuity of those small European cars to the comfort of a Chevrolet. Its name revealed GM's intentions. Corvair would have the verve of a Corvette and the solidity of a Bel Air. But despite the portmanteau, Corvair was unlike anything GM had made before. From its engine type to its placement in the car, from its suspension to the design of its bodywork. It was a car to beat the Europeans at their own fencing match, using European engineering techniques and sense of style against them. Underneath its seductive La Dolce Vita bodywork was what automotive engineers call a rear-rear layout. It's very rarely deployed. It means an engine in the rear of the car after the rear axle with power routed to the rear wheels. It sounds odd, as it's the complete inverse of the front-wheel drive, front-engine sedan norm we know today. But it's a great formula for a sporty machine. The original VW Beetle had this layout and gifted it to the Porsche 356, arguably the best sports car of its day. Putting the engine in the back of a rear-drive car meant that the majority of the mass was over the driven wheels, which gave the car superb traction when accelerating. But having all that mass back there demanded attention when braking hard or taking evasive action. And then there was the car's swing axle, one of the earliest and most basic independent rear suspension designs, which further complicated things. Unlike every car today, a swing axle lacks an outboard U-joint, 
where each axle meets the wheel hub. So, as the wheels move up and down, like when you take a corner hard, the hub's position is fixed. It can't pivot to keep the tire's alignment consistent to the road. This can upset the car's balance, but it is not terribly hard to control. Lots of cars from the 30s through the 50s had swing axles. Back with Brian Morris in the Corvair, we're applying the concept. So when you're exercising the car and you're uh, unloading the rear and there's less weight on the rear and the rear of it lifts up, like if you're charging into a turn really hot and you've got the front end kind of planted and the, the, the back end lifts up, swing axles will droop down. They, they sort of tuck under and it can take you by surprise if you're not ready for it. But, um, you know, in every car I've driven with swing axles, the car really tells you what it's doing. It's, it doesn't come as a surprise. And what you do in that situation, and this is really counterintuitive, uh, you have to give it more gas, not less. Like in a regular car, things get squirrely, you just lift off the gas pedal and everything rights itself. But in a car with swing axles and a rear engine, you need to settle the rear by accelerating and shifting the load of the thing and the mass backwards. So the wheels could pull out of it. Right, exactly. Right, so to, to avoid the droop, you have to do something that feels unnatural. But once you learn how to drive a car with, with those kinds of axles, like a Beetle or a 356 or a Go-Wing, it's really fun and it's natural. It's a skill that you have to develop, but once you do, it's pretty gratifying to drive a car like this. But if you didn't develop those skills, well, that's where the trouble came in. New York lawyer Ralph Nader, a legal advisor to the United States Senate inquiry, has just published a book called Unsafe at Any Speed. In an interview with Warner Troyer, Nader documented... Ralph Nader took aim at the Corvair in Unsafe at Any Speed, alleging that GM withheld critical safety equipment in the engineering of the car. You say that the Corvair for three or four years yes. was an unsafe vehicle to drive. Now, isn't that a pretty wild exaggeration? No, I think uh, the Corvair, uh, models 1960 to 63 and to some extent 64, had a rear axle, which is called technically a swing axle rear suspension system, which under certain predictable conditions of driving, the car would suddenly and unexpectedly go out of control. He thought GM should have put an anti-roll bar in the rear suspension to tame the car's handling. His argument was based on some 100 lawsuits against GM, filed by drivers who lost control of the car. More than a statistical anomaly. GM would settle most of these suits out of court. In his book, Nader did not hold back. From Unsafe's first sentence, Nader was off and running. For over half a century, he wrote, the automobile has brought death injury, and the most inestimable sorrow and deprivation to millions of people. Ralph Nader was not a fun lover like our friend Brian Morris with a yellow Corvair, or your humble narrator. Nader was all business. He went to Princeton for undergrad and then Harvard Law School after that. His best friends were books. He did not play hacky sack in the quad nor did he rip gnarly bong tokes with the bros at Sigma Chi. I would say he was monk-like, but he was way more self-righteous than any monk. Either it's sheer callousness or indifference, or they don't bother to find out how their cars behave. Nader took aim at the largest corporation in the world, arguing that the Corvair was a lethal, unpredictable viper of a car, ready to bite without provocation. That's simply not true. The car could be a handful, but it was predictable if you understood how it worked. Also, if you understood how to maintain it. In the Corvair's case, 
Maintaining balance and control depended a lot on setting the tire pressures properly. It required a conscientious approach to vehicle maintenance. But gas station attendants at the time had a saying, 24 pounds all around, and did not care about keeping the Corvair's tires at the right inflations. Those inflations, if we're getting technical, were 18 pounds per square inch in front to give the tire a fatter footprint and 30 pounds of pressure at the rear. Even more stability would be afforded by an anti-roll bar in the chassis, which GM would put in the second generation of the car in 1965. You had to take care of it. Most people did not. Though the Corvair was an above-average car aimed at an above-average driver, that's not necessarily who ended up buying it. Plenty of people in the 1960s looking for a small, affordable sedan walked into a Chevrolet dealership and drove out in a Corvair. The buyer for the car was probably more of a small sedan buyer. And so you had to apply that kind of sports car care to this car, which a lot of them probably didn't do. So a buyer of a 356 knows what he or she is getting into a little bit more. Whereas maybe the buyer of, of the Corvair was like, oh, it's just like, you know, the, the Bel Air, except a little bit smaller. I, I like it. It's sportier. And, and I can afford it. Yeah, and I can afford it. And, you know, I don't have to buy one of those imports. I think General Motors was saying, we're just as good as those sporty imports from Germany, and we're going to create a car that might challenge you a little bit. And I don't know if the average buyer was prepared for it. But also, there's nothing diabolical or, or crazy about this car. It's comfortable. In a Corvair. <laughs> this thing tracks great. You know when, uh, in the Blues Brothers, when Jake and Elwood go into Ray Charles Pawn Shop and need to buy some instruments? And I don't. You don't remember that? I and, don't. And he quotes in this ridiculous price on a Rhodes piano and uh, he goes that's crazy for this thing it's all beat up and uh, Ray Charles goes uh, 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 excuse me I don't think there's anything wrong with the action on this piano and that's kind of how I feel about this <laughs> nothing wrong with this it's great You just gotta know how to play it. You gotta know how to drive it. Cheated death yet again. <laughs> Pox on you, Nader. <laughs> Nader would have been unconvinced. In Unsafe at Any Speed, he suggests that the issue wasn't owner maintenance or driving behavior. The issue was that Chevrolet was too cheap that it chose to forego an anti-roll bar in the rear suspension because it added cost. Nader wrote, an automobile representing a reduction of 1,332 pounds of material, or more than one-third the weight of a standard 1960 Chevrolet that could sell for only about $200 less than standard models, would constitute a marvel of production cost efficiency and sales ingenuity. If the Corvair was such a miracle of profitability, with so much economic headroom, why would GM care about the cost of adding a slim piece of metal to the rear end? Doesn't make a lot of sense. By the time Nader's book came out in 1965, the Corvair had already evolved from swing axles to a more advanced and stable type of independent rear suspension. It was an admission on GM's part that the Corvair had room for improvement. Though a new suspension is a big alteration, changes are common in the car industry. An all-new model comes out, its flaws are cataloged by the press and owners, and the company works to modify it. It usually takes a few years. Though he wrote, damningly, that GM diluted its engineering standards for the Corvair, Nader's book did not prompt any changes to the car. The ebbs and flows of the car development process did that. Nader's book came out after GM made the change. He himself noted in the very first chapter that GM had made these upgrades. Still, 
Despite taking aim at the largest and richest corporation in America, the book did not make much noise, at least initially. But it worried GM. The corporation viewed it as an attack on its sterling reputation, and they sought to attack Nader in kind. When it became known that GM had Nader tailed by private investigators, the story erupted and the book got noticed. Another great moment in the history of unintended consequences. In the wake of the book, sales of the re-engineered Corvair without the swing axle collapsed. In three years, GM went from selling more than 200,000 Corvairs a year to fewer than 15,000. Even as GM modified the car for greater stability. Nader gets all the credit for this precipitous drop in sales. But it is also true that the Ford Mustang did as much as Nader to kill the unconventional little Chevy. Stampede, a stampede of 100,000 Mustangs. Ford Mustangs. In less than four months, the Ford Mustang has become the most talked about, most exciting and fastest selling new car in over 20 years. Seems like just about everyone wants one. It was the Mustang, after all, that made small American cars sexy. The 65 Fastback Mustang. They call it the 2 plus 2. It seats two up front, and when you fold down the two back seats, there's room for a beach umbrella, surfboard, and a pheasant under glass. Henry's become quite a gourmet, so I try to have everything ready for him when he gets here. Why don't you change your life? Take Ford a pitched the Stang down the middle of the strike zone at the largest, best educated, and most affluent generation America had ever seen. Baby boomers. Its arrival in 1964 coincided with the boomers' first driving years. If the Ford Model T mobilized a new America, then the Ford Mustang mobilized a new American entity. The Teenager. With the affordable and fun Mustang out on the street, the Corvair was doomed anyway. Still, the car and the book are forever linked. Nader made it so that Corvair's very name conjures disaster. It is GM's analog to Ford's Edsel. And with the book, Nader basically invented what we now know as consumer advocacy. As the saying goes, consumer advocacy focuses on fighting bads rather than producing goods. It is a movement that has given us cleaner air, cleaner water, and more temperate McDonald's coffee. Unsafe at Any Speed launched a movement. It was the immediate precursor to the establishment of the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and other government oversight agencies. Cars, of course, are safer now too. In the mid-60s, there were roughly five road fatalities for every 100 million miles driven. Today, it's roughly one fatality over that same distance, an 80% improvement. That's incredible progress, and I find it hard to argue that Nader's book didn't bring the issue into the mainstream. But there's one number I can't quite get past. We'll talk about it after the break. Hey listeners, while I've got you for a second, I want to talk to you about a podcast I've been enjoying that I think you might like too. It's called Patented, and it's all about history's most impactful inventions, from the airplane to the humble cup of coffee and the inventors who claim these ideas as their own. The history of inventions is full of myths, stories of eureka moments and genius lone inventors, but this reality is often a lot more complicated and interesting. Patented is hosted by Dallas Campbell, a science presenter who loves to try to get to the bottom of these messy stories. They have episodes on everything from how cornflakes were created on a foundation of some pretty questionable science, why monks were the most inventive minds of the Middle Ages, and who should really get credit for the first motion picture. Spoiler, it's not Thomas Edison. Coming up, they have episodes on cryonics, 
contactless payment, and plastic surgery. So if any of that sounds up your alley, you can subscribe to Patented, History of Inventions, from our friends over at History Hit on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Nader's advocacy in the 1960s brought about a new awareness around automotive safety. But there's one statistic that nags at me. Before Nader entered the scene, roughly 40,000 people died per year in car collisions. Today, 40,000 people per year still die in car collisions. Sure, the population's larger, so the proportion of deaths is down, and fatalities per mile is a fraction of what it was. But 40,000 deaths is still 40,000 deaths. That's 40,000 real people. Mothers, daughters, sons and fathers. This in an age of airbags, passenger safety cells, crumple zones, blind spot warnings, and a host of other safety innovations that didn't exist 65 years ago. With all the advances in automotive and road safety in those intervening six decades, you'd think that that number would be much, much lower. So why is it still so high? Well, one theory is that in the wake of Nader, we stopped focusing on driver proficiency and started letting the car assume responsibility for our safety. Kenneth White wrote a book about that shift. In the sack of Detroit, he tells us how it played out. So it wasn't until the 20s when everybody had a car and people were using cars a lot more and the roads were better and they were driving faster and driving off them faster. <laughs> That's when uh, traffic safety became more of an issue. And so Herbert Hoover has this uh, big confab uh, in, in the 1920s where he invites the industry, he invites uh, health authorities he invites municipal and state governments and said you know we got to do something about it let's pull together all the information we have about uh auto safety and come up with a, a a general approach to the problem and that's where the triple e approach came from triple e it stands for education engineering and enforcement education was about making sure people knew that cars were dangerous and that they knew how to drive how to share the road, and how to maintain their vehicles. Engineering concerned road design and ensuring that highways were properly marked and had good sight lines and grading. This led to the divided highway and much greater levels of highway safety. And enforcement, well, you know what that means. But while the proportion of deaths relative to driven miles was going down, a huge number of people were still dying in car crashes. It was the medical community that first said, you know, maybe Tripoli e isn't everything here. Maybe there's something else we can do to keep people from getting, you know, smashed to pieces in, in their automobiles. They were more concerned with what was called the second collision, which was after the bad thing on the road has happened and then driver or passenger hits the dashboard or goes flying out of the vehicle. And that's where the whole second collision theory, uh, which was uh, taken as an alternative to uh, the Triple E school, came into play in the 1950s. Nader was a second collision man. He thought the car was the problem, not the driver. In Unsafe, he called the Corvair an American car that abruptly decides to do the driving for the driver. The idea that we had to concentrate now on car interiors as the leading factor in uh, you know, human carnage was appealing to uh, the medical folks. But uh, it was also appealing to the tort industry in the U.S. Uh, in the 50s, the, the uh, tort industry saw an opportunity to use second collision theory to argue that all traffic accidents were the responsibility of car makers because 
if car makers could make a crash proof car and surely to God car makers being big and rich and smart and you know the world's best engineers knew how to make a crash proof car uh, if uh, they could make a crash proof car and weren't making a crash proof car they were liable for all of those deaths on the road they had failed to give people the degree of safety to which they were entitled. GM had faith in the customer. They figured that drivers could play up to the Corvair in much the way an average tennis player improves when hitting with a great one. Nader argued that that trust was misplaced. He thought that people shouldn't have to adapt to the car and shouldn't have to maintain awareness or tire pressures to keep the car shiny side up. It was the corporation's responsibility to protect us from the effects of our own incompetence. But the irony is that the Corvair didn't require special skills. It was not a hard car to drive fast, nor an inherently dangerous one. You just had to learn how it behaved and how to maintain it. Nader, a legendary autodidact, did not think other people were capable of such feats. The density of safety features in our cars today is generally considered an outgrowth of this thinking. The safety crisis precipitated by Nader did lead to safer cars. It led to cars with airbags, with anti-lock brakes, with traction control, and now with all kinds of driver assist technology. So. Yeah, those things came after Nader. Did they really come because of Nader? Uh, I, I don't think that necessarily follows. I mean, uh, a lot of the uh, things like the traction control were already operable in some European models before then. It, you know, it took time for uh, Detroit to adopt the technology and put it in uh, cars, but it didn't do so because the government told it uh, to. It did, it did it in when it was ready. I would argue that actually the second collision view that airbags were the answer to everything actually set America back in terms of public safety and killed more people than would otherwise have died uh, because the focus on the car and the crashworthiness of the car uh, detracted entirely from what had been a fairly steady concern about the driver and what the driver was doing. Was the driver sober? Uh, was the driver reckless? Did the driver bother to put on his seatbelt? Here's what we have to wrestle with. The set of ideas Nader espoused undoubtedly led to cars that better protected us. But did they make us better? Road fatalities may be down, but is that because we're better drivers? Or is it because the car is shouldering the work? Does the average American driver today have more mastery of their 5,000 pound car than they did 60 years ago? Or do we think of it as an appliance, a four-wheeled microwave, not really understanding how it works, never taking it to or beyond the limits of its capabilities unless we're about to crash into something? Do we even know what's happening under our feet? These are, of course, all rhetorical questions. We know what happens when something goes wrong. We're unprepared for it. We lack the skill to react appropriately. We crash into stuff and the airbags and crumple zones keep us from dying. We have followed second collision philosophy, not triple E. Think about the path that begins at the Corvair. Because some of its buyers didn't understand it, they didn't properly maintain it. And because that small group of drivers got into trouble with it, cars began to be engineered for the lowest level of skill. We began to blame the car for our bad driving, which led the car makers to try to bubble wrap every aspect of their operation. And we became reliant on that safety net. Thus began a long erosion of skills that led us to now the age of the no-consequences car. Stuff on new cars meant to help us avoid crashing on account of our own distraction. Stuff like lane-keeping, blind-spot monitoring, backup cameras, 
These are all ultimately making us less attentive drivers. How many of us feel safe to eat while driving, to grab a quick beer on the way home from work, to send a really important meme to our coworker, secure in the knowledge that the traction control and lane keeping and braking assist will sort it all out. Fatalities per mile driven may be down, but 40,000 people are still dying on the road every year. That's where the negligence lies, the loose nut behind the wheel. The Corvair was a new kind of car from a high-riding General Motors. More sophisticated, more innovative, and more of a European-style sedan than anything the corporation had produced to that point. The Corvair was General Motors flexing its muscles, showing the world that it could out-engineer and outthink the foreign competition. The Corvair tragedy lies in the car it was trying to be and how those aspirations stalled. The Corvair affair cut down an emergent style of driver-oriented American car. It deprived a generation of car enthusiasts an American alternative to European sports sedans. But more than any of that, it may have wounded an important part of the American spirit. Who knows what might have happened if the Corvair had succeeded? if we sought to make drivers safer rather than just the cars? We'll never know. Nader let us off the hook. Our independence and self-determination have caveats now. We are more reliant than ever on big corporations to keep us safe. And isn't that a scarier concept than a swing axle? Car Show is written and hosted by me, Eddie Alterman. It's produced by Sam Dingman, Jacob Smith, and Amy Gaines. Our editor is Jen Guerra. Original music and mastering by Ben Tolliday. Our executive producer is Mia Lobel. Our show art was designed by Sean Carney and airbrushed by Greg Lefevre. Our patron saints are Lital Malad and Justine Lang. Special thanks to my guests, Brian Morris and Kenneth White. Check out Ken's book, The Sack of Detroit, all about GM's dominant era. Car Show is a production of Pushkin Industries. If you love this show and others from Pushkin Industries, consider subscribing to Pushkin Plus. Pushkin Plus is a podcast subscription that offers bonus content and uninterrupted listening for just $4.99 a month. Look for Pushkin Plus on Apple Podcast subscriptions. To find more Pushkin podcasts, listen on the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts.